It's such a privilege to be here and kind of wrapping up this stewardship week. And I think this is going to be a little bit different chapel for you, and I hope it is. I want it to be interactive. I'd love for you guys to ask questions. Um, what we're going to be talking about is really, really huge. And um, I, I have 25 minutes to rock your world, give you a few tools to use to get out of debt. Amen? Amen. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. And encur encourage you to change your evil ways. That's my goal today. In love, of course. No small challenge. Uh, I am a three-time Biola Talbot graduate, and uh, my PhD was actually in stewardship and fundraising. That's why I love this topic. I have two Biola daughters one of which married her husband from Biola, so we are Biola through and through. My wife, Julie, also graduated from Biola. As uh, Sean mentioned, I teach a class called Faith and Money, and uh, a lot of undergraduate students come into my class and they have no idea the debt that they are carrying. Literally, they come in, they don't know the loans that they have, they don't know a strategy to get out of debt. Um, average debt now at Biola is about 36,000. And I'm not gonna have you raise your hands to tell me who goes over that. But I've had students in class with $150,000 of college debt. It's like, a, it's like a house payment, guys and gals. It, it's something that we've gotta have a strategy. First, we should have a strategy not to get in. But if you're in it, and some of you may well be in it, we've gotta figure out how to get you out of it. And that's my goal today. I wanna read you a little note that I got um, on email. This was from a former student, now an alumna. She says, I have a financial dilemma I'd like your advice on. I'm, I planned on doing a one-year internship with a missions organization in Poland starting in August. This has been my plan since I was 16 to see if this is what I want to do long term. Two days ago, my mother told me I will owe my parents a minimum of $400 a month for the next nine years in order to help pay off Parent PLUS loans. This is equal to one-third of my Poland expenses. I would be living off full support and making no money in Poland. I just don't feel right to A, leave a load of debt, or B, have supporters pay off my loans that in the end will be more than half of what I need to serve in Poland. I feel the most biblical thing to do is to stay in the US and pay off my debt as fast as possible, even if that is a decade. Even if I found supporters who could take care of that while I'm in Poland, which I don't feel right about, that would not be the fastest way to pay it off. This is not unusual, guys and gals. This is, this is a case that happens time after time. When you came in, you received kind of a little handout. Everybody get the handout? Uh, anybody not get it? Do you need one? Oh, okay, you got it. Um, on the handout, there are some numbers up at the top. One, two, three. I would like all the threes to please stand. If you are a three, would you please stand up and stay standing for just a minute? We got a shortage of threes over there. there there's got to be more. Um, just about a third of Biola graduates will have to find work outside of their passion in order to pay off the debt that they are carrying at the time of graduation. About a third of you fit into that category. Many of you uh, desire to go into ministry or community services or education, but you will be slaves. Get the word. You will be slaves to the debt that you are carrying out of Biola. We're gonna talk more about this in the next few minutes, and if this is you, we're going to come up with a plan to help you get out of it, right? And ones and twos, don't be so you know, snug, smug down on the seat, because the culture is seeking ways to drag you into debt slavery as well. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Thanks, you guys could be seated. We know that God can provide. I'm sure some of you are examples of that here in your education. And you would not be here without God's provision. Amen? Amen? I agree. My goal today is to give you some basic tools to use, and I'll be around after, and my office is always open if you have questions that surface. If I can help you avoid some of the pitfalls that Julie and I have had both in our marriage, uh, in the financial side, and really in how we spend our money, I would love to do that. It will save a lot of grief for you. So let's get started. First with some overarching thoughts, uh, we get into trouble when we listen to what culture says rather than what scripture says. The topic of money and finance is huge in scripture. Did you know 17 of the 38 parables deal with money? 17 of 38. There are 2,172 mentions about possessions, 
Money is mentioned three times more than love, eight times more than belief, and seven times more than prayer. If it's there so much, do you think it's important to God? Yeah, I think so. I think we should probably pay attention. Let's do a quick survey. Um, How many of you would say that money has been or is a major concern for you? Raise your hands, we're all family, right? Pretty much everybody. How many of you who are married would say that uh, money has been an issue in your marriage? Raise them up, be be, be honest, I would say yes. Um, You know what, money is the number one cause of divorce and issues in marriage, yikes. It is, It's, it's a big issue. So why do we spend money on things we don't really need. 1 Timothy 6, 8 says uh, we should be satisfied with two things. Anybody know what the two things are? What are they? You do from class. Talk to me. Food and clothing. clothing. Yeah, food and clothing. I don't know about you guys. I struggle with that because I think big screen TV should be on the list, right? That's kind of the way it is. Food and clothing. Moreland and Isler have written a really good book on today's confusion about happiness. I use a chapter from it in Faith and Money. Um, it's, a, it's a great book. Anybody heard of The Empty Self? Yes. Yeah, be proud. The Empty Self is filled up with the consumption of goods, calories, experiences, politicians, romantic partners, and empathetic therapists and experiences. There's a significant absence of community tradition, shared meaning, a lack of personal conviction and worth, and it embodies the absences as a chronic, undifferentiated emotional hunger. In other words, there is a hole in us, guys and gals. There's there's an empty self, and the world tells us to fill the empty self with stuff that makes us happy. Yet if we read Ecclesiastes, the guy that's probably the richest man that ever lived, Solomon, said it's all striving after wind. That's a pretty, I hope you get that picture. It's all striving after wind. No thing will make you happy. I guess it's no surprise to find out what the world is telling us in this area is all wrong. The authors go on to say, the empty self is a set of values, motives, and habits of thought, feeling, and behavior that make progress in the maturity in the way of Christ extremely difficult. If you fill that empty self with stuff, you will be displacing God because God is the only thing that can fill the empty self. So what's the answer? To fill the void with the things of Christ and his kingdom rather than this kingdom. And you know what, it's so countercultural. It's absolutely countercultural. I also don't wanna miss a brief discussion on money and stewardship because it affects everything we do and it's also part of this week's chapel series. Uh, Money, we all kind of know what that is, but stewardship is something that maybe you haven't heard or talked about related to the topic of finance. Stewardship is hmm, what we do with what God has entrusted to us. We know that everything we have belongs to God, and we know we are called to be good stewards of what he has entrusted to us. That's a great concept. It's really hard to grab hold of. But everything that you have, everything that you own, your car, whatever it is, belongs to God. May I borrow your car? Yes, you may borrow God's car. Say that. Try that when somebody wants to borrow your car and see what they say. It'll open up their eyes, right? Hey, can I buy your new blue top? Or, you know, can I, can I borrow that? Can I use that? Well, you may borrow God's top. That would be fine. And just see what happens. Deuteronomy 10.14 Check it out. Um, It tells us that everything belongs to God, and we will be held accountable on how and what we do with these resources. Did we invest well? Did we multiply it? Did we spend it all? Did we bury it under our mattress? That also means that we owe God more than just a 10% tithe. How many of you heard about the 10% tithe, right? Is that what your parents taught you? Yeah? Well, it's actually more like 26%. In Scripture, that's the the tithe of the Old Testament with taxes and fees was about 26%. We owe him everything, however, and we need to remember that. Well, if you're taking notes, three passages I love that relate to this. And for sake of time, we're okay. Um, I'm going to just give you the passages, and you kind of know these. These are verses that you know. Matthew 5, 13 through 16 talks about us being salt and light. All right, I'm going to read it. It's here. Matthew 5. 13 through 16, here you go. 
For you are the salt of the earth, and if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but out on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works, glorify your Father who is in heaven. You know what? We need to act differently than the world, right? We need to act differently because we are an example to the world. And that includes the things that we buy and how we live. Romans 12, 1 and 2, one of my favorite passages of Scripture, talks about us being nonconformists. We are transformed by the renewing of our mind. We live differently. One of the hardest areas to live differently in this culture is in the area of money because we so conform to what the world says, right? Read the passage, it's a great passage. Third passage for your notes, 1 Timothy 6, 8 through 11 tells us that we are not to desire to get rich. How many business majors? Business majors, okay, you guys are gonna really struggle with this one because you know this is part of who you are, right? Uh, it's, it's part of who we are in our existence, our desire to get rich, but scripture tells us not to. It will lead to destruction, right? Okay, let's talk a little bit about debt and loans. I'm going to try to go through these kind of fast. Um, anybody planning to go on the mission field or work in uh, church work or education, community service, that type of thing? You are the ones that are really going to struggle with this concept of debt because the incomes that you will make will not allow you to do what your heart, your desires are. And the tragedy is that God may be calling you to do something that you can't do because of your debt. All right, here you go. Um, I've been asked to kind of deal with debt, and I want to do that. Uh, one of the things that's really important here to see, Scripture um, is very clear that we are not to have debt. But what it's really talking about is the ability to pay back the debt that you have, okay? So there's a fine line there. I am not encouraging debt. Listen to that carefully. But is it okay to buy a car with a loan? It's not rhetorical. Is it okay to buy a car with a loan? Yes. How about a house with a loan? Yes. Yeah, when is it wrong? When you can't pay it back, right? Don't get into debt that you cannot service. Now I'm not saying that a debt is good. I'm not saying that, but I am saying, and it's hard to live without debt, but I am saying be careful about the debt that you have. I'm gonna give you a couple of tools today that will help you in this area. So take notes here. These are really important. Just a couple of methods to, and we do this in our faith and money class. Uh, these tools are going to build on each other so you kind of get an idea of what they are. First, I want you to start keeping a record of every expense you have for a couple of months, or even better, go three months. Every expense, buy a little notebook, um, and everything you, everything you buy, Starbucks, TJ Maxx, everything. At the end of the month, do, it, do them if you want. You can do them in each color differently, you know, like gases, blue, or whatever, and keep a record. It will be eye-opening for you to see where your money is going, all right? Do it for two or three months. You will be amazed at where your money goes. If you're like most of it, it's food, and like most of us, it's food, a lot will be for gas for the car, those types of things. The, the trick is to remember to put it in the book. If you're married, do one for both of you. Have both of you do it. It will give you some great insights. It doesn't mean that you can't have a, lo a moco, lato, espresso, nonfat decaf once in a while, right? Just not every night. Our favorite is yogurt land. You guys like yogurt land? You know, 30 cents an ounce, it's just so cheap, and then you get the big stack with all this sticky, yummy goodness, $6 dessert. So you'll have to write it in the book, right? So just be aware of that, and uh, I'm just saying it's gonna change how you go, how you, how you spend. Number two, second thing, you need to know where your assets and your liabilities are. There's a form in there called the personal financial statement. I encourage you to, to start to fill out the personal financial statement. Assets, liabilities. I do this every month. And I list my assets and I list the liabilities that I have. The goal is to increase the assets and reduce the liabilities. And it will become real clear to you real fast where you stand. If you do this on a regular basis, it's eye-opening. Is there a trend? Do you see more assets? Do you see more liabilities growing every month? It's a great tool. Uh, then, the third tool. Next tool is the debt list. 
The debt list takes the detail of debt from the personal financial statement and it fleshes it out. You guys have got to do this. Take the debts that you have, here's a key, put them in order of interest rates, right? Highest interest rates at the top, lowest interest rates at the bottom. You make payments on everything, minimum payments on everything, but you start with the highest interest rates to, to pour the funds down on that one. When that one is paid off, you roll that into the next one. You don't go out and buy something else, right? But you roll it into the next one and then into the next one and then into the, in the next one, and pretty soon your debts are paid off. It's an awesome thing. It's the snowball debt process, and that's what I encourage you to do with that debt list. Okay. Now we're gonna to have to crank. This usually takes me a whole class to do this one. I want you to work with me on creating a budget. Creating a budget, we're gonna go through this fairly quickly. How many of you have a budget now? Good, good. I, I encourage, is it easy to stay with? I don't know. Well, let's, let's kind of put this together. Maybe this one will help you. Um, I've got uh, 14 minutes. On, on A, what's the top of your budget? What does everything start with? Income, without an income you don't have a budget, right? I use the gross figure. What does gross mean? It means it's before taxes, it's everything. So put on there income. Some of you are going, my income is really gross, I know. Um, but A, income, gross. Two, B, what's second you think? Tithe, absolutely. Tithe or first fruits. Old Testament as we mentioned, this was 26%. A good rule of thumb for you, put tithe and put 10%. Uh, yes, it's an Old Testament uh, principle, but it works great now. Seek to go there, and then if you can grow it, grow it. Just because you are in college or seminary, don't think that means that you don't need to be giving. I have students come to me and say, I don't really attend a church on a regular basis, so I'm not tithing. That's not biblical. You guys need to get into the habit even now, and now is even more important. If you will remember the widow's might, Christ was watching the widow. He watched her, he knew what she gave, he knew her needs, and he served her as a group. He told the apostles, take care of her needs, right? So be aware that it's important to give now. Okay, C, taxes, taxes. Depending on how much you make, IRS is gonna take theirs right off the top, right? So um, average for you guys, if you put a percentage in there, is probably in the eight to 10% range. Julie and I are in the 35% range. That means that 35% of everything that we make goes to the government. It's painful. So you look for ways to kind of protect that. You give it. You do a lot that kind of helps protect that. But about 8 to 10% for most of you. Some of you may be even less than that because you're not making that much. So you may have the ability to, to make some of that back. But that's kind of a good rule of thumb as you're doing your budget. Some of you may be in the 10 to 20% range, depending on the kind of money that you're making. Okay, D, housing, housing. General rule of thumb for housing is 25 to 35% of your income will go for housing. And this is the cost for your apartment or your house. It needs to be paid every month or you will be living in a van down by the river, okay? That's what I'm just saying. Make sure that it's, that it's built into your budget. Um, there are ways around it. Living at home with your parents is not a bad thing. What I advise, amen, what I advise, how many of you are gonna live home with your parents after you graduate? Be proud, raise them up high. I am so proud of every one of you. Um, but make sure you've talked it through with your parents. You wanna make sure that you're, that you're, dealing, a bit, that you're dealing well with them. And I, I actually encourage you to even pay a little bit of rent. You'll feel better about it. They'll feel a lot better about it, right? So talk it through with your parents. It's a great way to go. All right, um, E, food. Now this, remember this is, um, this is about 15% of your budget, food. And it can get a lot bigger than that really quick, right? But it's a, it's a pretty good rule of thumb, 15%. And this isn't going out to steak and lobster every night. This is eating at home. It may be uh, mac and cheese, you know. But it's, a, it, it's living to sustain, right? You've got to be able to eat. So make sure this is built into your budget. If you go out to eat a lot, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall into another category called entertainment. We'll get to that here in a minute. Okay, under F, non-negotiable debt service. Non-negotiable debt service. What debts do you have that are non-negotiable? Car loans, school loans, other loans are debt. There is no percentage on this because this is gonna vary for every one of you. It's gonna be different for each one of you. 
Um, we could have a discussion on good debt versus bad debt. We don't have time for that. But right now, let's just say that this is an important consideration. Non-negotiable debt must be paid every month or it will hurt your credit scores. How many of you know what a credit score is, a FICO score? For those of you who don't, I don't have a lot of time to talk about it today. If you have questions about it, see me. Why is it important? Bottom line, if your credit score is bad, you cannot get cheap loans. You do not get good money when you go in for a loan. If your credit score is good, you can get better loans. And I wish I could kind of flesh it out because there's a ton of detail there. But you want a good FICO score. You want a good credit score. And if it's bad, see me. We'll help you kind of build it up. But it's huge. It's really, really, really important. Um, one quick comment because I don't want to miss this. Does it help on your credit card to pay down your, your balance every month? How many would say yes, it, it helps your credit score? Some hesitation. It does not, actually. Uh, it will not improve your credit score to pay down your credit card every month. It will improve your credit score if you carry over a small balance on your credit card because then it becomes a loan. Do I encourage credit card debt? Absolutely not. It's the most expensive money you can borrow. Your, your school loans will also help you improve your FICO, your credit score. Make your payments on those before, before you say, I'm gonna use my credit card to build up my, my FICO score. Okay, we're cranking here. Let's see, um, so that's your non-negotiable debt. Next category, negotiable debt. Credit card debt is negotiable. You don't have to pay the whole amount every month, right? You can negotiate that down. And uh, there are some other negotiable types of debt that you can buy. When you go to buy shampoo, you know, negotiable debt would say, uh, I don't have to buy the most expensive shampoo. Things like that fit into this category, negotiable debt. You can negotiate the kinds of expenses that you're gonna have. Um, should you have a credit card going back to credit card? I'd say a guarded yes, because it will help you kind of function in life. Uh, another whole topic for conversation though. See me if you have questions about that. Clothing is next, H, clothing. Two categories here. The first is must-haves. These are clothes that you have to have to work or your spouse has to have to work or, or you have to have to do your job, right? The second category is entertainment related. I know that sounds a little weird, clothes that are entertainment related, but that's what this is. The entertainment related really fits into another category. It fits into the entertainment side. But clothing, must-haves fit in on this part of the budget. I, savings, savings. Put away for future needs. Two types of savings here. The first is long-term, which is like your retirement account, uh, those types of things. The second is short-term. That's I'm gonna need new, car, new, new tires on my car, right? I'm gonna need a new car. Those are savings that you know are gonna be short-term. So make sure you have built both of those into your budget. And finally, J is entertainment, right? Eating out, movies, shopping, they can all be entertainment. They're not wrong, you just need to regulate your budget accordingly. So what percentages do you fit into all those categories? It all depends on the debt that you are carrying. The debt will make a difference throughout the categories. The more debt you have, it means you, may, you need to adjust the other categories of your budget. Is this scary to you guys? Anybody, be honest, is this scary? Is your debt scary? It should be a little bit scary, but what I want you to realize is it's much less scary when you know what it is, when you know what your budget needs to be, and you've got a plan in place to reduce it. Make sense? Uh, my office is up in Metzger. If you are just really struggling with any of this, your debt, whatever it looks like, I would love to meet with you, kind of work it through with you. Um, money matters is this one, two, three, four, fifth row right here. If you have questions, you wanna go down and talk to accounting, they would love to visit with you. There's a group of people down there that really care about your welfare, and um, I encourage you to see them. See, come see me up in Alumni. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.